On board Shokaku, Nagumo still conferred with Kusaka. What is our deployment now? Nagumo asked. Battleships Hiei and Kirishima, cruiser Chikuma and seven destroyers of Rear Admiral Koki Ebe are ahead of us, sixty to eighty miles to the south, Kusaka replied. Rear Admiral Chuichi Hara's cruiser tone and destroyer Terutsuki are two hundred miles to the east. Rear Admiral Kakuta's force is three hundred miles to the west. Any reports on enemy carriers? No, sir. The ensuing brief silence was broken by Nagumo, who spoke hesitantly, meditatively, as if thinking aloud. At midway, the enemy struck us at a time of his choosing. Now, too, there is no doubt that the enemy pinpoints our position as if on a chessboard, but we are running blind. Commander Takada, a staff officer, ventured to speak. Excuse me, sir. May I suggest sending a message to Yamato, asking for instructions? Nagumo was silent. Kusaka closed his eyes for a few moments, then opened them and said, All right, Takada, take this message. From Kusaka, 1st Air Fleet Chief of Staff, to Vice Admiral Matome Ugaki, Combined Fleet Chief of Staff. May I suggest halting our southward advance until we receive definite word that the army has captured Guadalcanal airfields? There seems to be a possibility of our being trapped if we continue going like this. Nagumo listened intently and nodded his concurrence. The message was sent, and a grim silence descended on the cabin. Nagumo and his staff settled down to wait for an answer. My destroyer Amatsukaze was cruising 2,000 metres to port of flagship Shokaku. We were part of the ring formation of one cruiser and nine destroyers which surrounded the flagship and carriers Zuikaku and Zuiho of Carrier Division 1. Nagumo and Kusaka had learned a bitter and costly lesson at Midway, and they were taking full precautions this time. Shortly after midnight, the long-awaited reply arrived from Truk. From Ugaki to Kusaka, your striking force will proceed quickly to the enemy direction. The operation orders stand without change. Kusaka bit his lip. Takada groaned. Nagumo snorted, then said calmly, All right, start fueling the carriers. The three carriers slowed down to take on oil in the dark of night. By daybreak of October 25, the painstaking process was almost completed when an orderly dashed into the Admiral's cabin with a message. Nagumo was dozing. He awakened instantly and read the report from one of the patrol planes supposed to be circling above his carriers. I have shot down an enemy plane, apparently a scout. Nagumo jumped to his feet, cut refueling, turned the carriers around and head due north. At 5.30, the Nagumo and Kakuta forces retreated at 20 knots to the north-northeast. As soon as Nagumo heard that the enemy scout plane had been shot down, he ordered the drastic turn, something he failed to do at midway, because he decided the enemy had obtained full information about the strength and composition of his force. The Americans failed to foresee this decision of Nagumo's, and a few hours later their planes searched vainly where his ships should have been. Nagumo sent dozens of scout planes in all directions, but they sighted no enemy carriers. They did, however, see and report two Allied battleships, five cruisers and twelve destroyers. After running northward for twelve hours, Nagumo again directed fueling for all his ships, including the three carriers. At nineteen, the two Japanese task forces reversed course and headed south at twenty knots. It was a warm, moonlit night. On weather decks, however, a breeze flapped flags and dried out sweaty clothes. Nagumo was again huddled with staff officers in the heavy atmosphere of his cabin. Everyone was glum. We must presume that the enemy contact has failed, one said. From the enemy radioactivity, they may still be in contact with our vanguard units. Nagumo closed his eyes, as though in pain. Kusaka wiped sweat from his face. Commander Takada squirmed. At fifty minutes past midnight, October 26, every alarm sounded on carrier Shokaku. Air raid! Air raid! Staff officers jumped. Takada dashed to the bridge in time to see four water plumes rising on the starboard side of carrier Zuikaku, some five thousand metres astern of Shokaku. He held his breath until the water pillars subsided, and he saw that Zuikaku was still safe. The bombs had fallen at least three hundred metres away from the carrier. Takada almost fell down the ladder, racing to the Admiral's cabin to report these events. Nagumo and Kusaka were still in their chairs. When Takada reported what he had seen, the two Admirals looked at each other and said exactly the same thing. 
let's turn around. From the bridge of Amatsukaze, I saw Shokaku's signal light blink. All ships turn 180 degrees to starboard. And then the big black ship started its abrupt turn. A second blinker light order followed shortly. Speed of advance, 24 knots. And the third message came at 1.30 as the turn was completed. All ships of this force steady on course zero degrees. The moon vanished into the clouds and an uneasy hour passed while we braced for an all-out attack by the enemy. Not a single enemy appeared. It was becoming evident that the plane which had hit and so poorly at Zuikaku had committed a grave blunder. It had sounded an alarm, a most vital alarm, to which the Japanese responded promptly to the distinct disadvantage of the enemy. Dawn of October 26 was to break at 3.45. In the pre-dawn darkness, red-shaded flashlights moved to and fro on Shokaku's deck. It was plain that all hands were busy in the carrier. At 2.15 our radio picked up a report that the vanguard unit, then running far to our rear, had catapulted seven reconnaissance planes. Thirty minutes later, thirteen scouts zoomed up from the decks of our carriers. Then the whole fleet turned about again and headed once more to the south. By morning's light I saw Shokaku pilots near their planes, ready for battle at a moment's notice. Admiral Nagumo was clearly visible on the bridge, easily identified by his snow-white gloves. About five, the radio room voice tube suddenly came to life as Ensign Hideo Shoji shouted excitedly, Shokaku scout plane reports a large enemy force at KHI-7. Force consists of one Saratoga-class carrier and 15 other ships heading northwestward. 450 hours. I was speechless at discovering that KH-17 was 210 miles distant on bearing 125 degrees. We had figured that the enemy would be directly ahead of us, or even slightly to the right. Cold chills ran down my spine. My officers took a look at the chart and groaned. Similar consternation was being felt on the bridge of every Japanese ship. Everyone suddenly realised how narrowly we had escaped an enemy trap. Had we maintained a southern advance without the two turnarounds and the northern run, the Americans could have struck at us from the rear and battered us into a disastrous defeat. On Shokaku's bridge, Admiral Nagumo grinned for the first time in many hours. He ordered an immediate air sortie, and planes began rolling down the deck. Everyone had learned at midway that the slightest hesitation could cause a debacle. Shokaku and Zuikaku launched 40 bombers and 27 fighters within 15 minutes. Their speedy action was in marked contrast to the sluggish Ryujo operations I had witnessed two months earlier in this same area. Two American scout planes cut through the overcast and suddenly swooped to spray a few bombs on carrier Zuiho. Their daring paid off. One bomb pierced the flight deck aft and exploded. The resulting fire was soon put under control, but the deck was ruined. Zuiho's skipper signalled that she could launch planes, but could not receive any on her damaged deck. Nagumo reluctantly ordered Zuiho to withdraw after dispatching all her fighters. Combustibles were removed from every ship's deck, and all water pipes were opened. The enemy had located our forces and might appear in force any moment. A second wave of Japanese attackers, including Zuiho's 16 fighters, was launched by six. All carriers were now left without air cover. We had to strike the enemy first. Meanwhile, in Carrier Junio, Admiral Kakuta angrily stamped his feet at learning that the enemy was 3.30 miles away. He ordered his ships to head southeast at full speed, and enthusiastic boilermen responded instantly. The bulky converted carrier reached her maximum speed of 26 knots in a record 10 minutes, instead of the usual 20. Junio sprang from the ring formation, leaving behind her three escorting destroyers. The destroyer men gaped at seeing the most sluggish carrier in service running away from them. It took the destroyers more than an hour to catch up with their darting flagship. The three 30-mile distance to enemy targets was not prohibitively far. Kakuta could have had his planes return to the nearer Shokaku or Zuikaku instead of trying to range back to Junyo. But he wanted to close with the enemy so that he could juggle his few combat planes for as many attacks as possible. The enemy's timing and movements were most adroit, but he failed to reckon that the smaller, more distant task force with its lone carrier would offer such a determined fight. Starting at 7.14, Kakuta sent out 29 planes in three attack waves to strike the enemy. Breakfast that day was even more Spartan than usual. 
I was munching the emergency fare of biscuits and water when a scout bomber came in, wagging its wings for identification, to make a neat landing on Shokaku's deck. Handling crews were at work on the plane as soon as it stopped, readying it for another sortie. The plane was quickly rolled to one side as six fighters sped down the deck to fly combat air patrol over our ships. An enemy onslaught was expected at any moment. The first word from our own attack planes came at 7.10 when they announced, Enemy carrier sighted. All planes attacking. The 40 bombers and torpedo planes scored several direct hits and many near misses on carrier Hornet in a concentrated attack which lasted about 10 minutes in all. My attention was diverted from this exciting news by the return of another bomber plane, which tried to land on Shokaku's deck. The plane was crippled and had to ditch near the carrier's stern. Amatsukaze raced to rescue the crew, stopped near the sinking plane, and lowered a rescue boat. While this operation was in progress, enemy planes were sighted. General alarm was sounded, and all hands went to battle stations. I glanced up and saw about a dozen dive bombers approaching from out of a cloud bank at 2,000 metres. I continued our rescue operation, confident that the planes would choose carrier Shokaku for their target rather than my little destroyer. While Amatsukaze's boat was returning with the two rescued flyers, all ships opened fire at the approaching enemy planes, and they were gleefully jumped by our six combat air patrol fighters. Amatsukaze joined the fray as quickly as possible. How different was Japanese response from what it had been two months earlier, when carrier Ryujo had been under air attack? Two enemy torpedo planes were hit by our fighters, blew up in smoke, and disappeared. One of our fighters rammed a third bomber, causing a terrible explosion which blotted out both planes in an instant. I saw two enemy bombers, apparently hit by gunfire, fall into the sea. Very strangely, I saw not a single American fighter, I wondered why these enemy attackers came without escort. The number of enemy planes was decreasing. The skies were filled with white and yellow smoke from the barrage of our ships, anti-aircraft fire. It appeared that we might pull through this raid unscathed. Amatsukaze was zigzagging at a steady 33 knots, but half of my attention was devoted to Shokaku, which needed all possible protection. I saw two enemy bombers pierce Shokaku's gunfire and dive full toward the carrier from a height of about 700 meters. The planes arced up at the last moment and disappeared into the clouds. The next instant I saw two or three silver streaks, which appeared like thunderbolts, reaching toward the bulky carrier. Their impact raised flashes at the fore and amidship near the bridge of Shokaku. The whole deck bulged quietly and burst. Flames shot from the cleavages. I groaned as the flames rose and black and white smoke came belching out of the deck. The flagship was hit at last, and how vulnerable it was by four bombs. Shokaku turned, maintaining a speed of more than 30 knots. Apparently the engines were not damaged. The ship started to withdraw with two destroyers as escorts. Before leaving the area, Nagumo signalled instructions for me to escort Zuikaku, the only carrier of his force remaining in operation, I was still bewildered at Shokaku's vulnerability. Why was it so weak with all its crack flyers and efficient crew? Ryujo's sinking was not too shocking in view of its poor combat efficiency, but Shokaku's defeat confounded me. No time, however, for such disturbing thoughts. There was work to be done. The enemy air raid was over, but more waves might be coming at any time to attack Zuikaku. Furthermore, Zuikaku had to retrieve the returning planes of all three carriers, it was obvious that some of these planes, particularly damaged ones, would have to ditch. Amatsukaze headed toward Zuikaku at full speed. An hour passed with no fresh assault by the enemy. We were grateful for a number of Zuiho's fighters, which returned in small groups. Their pilots explained the mystery of the lack of fighter escorts for the bombers which attacked Shokaku. The first Japanese sortie of 40 bombers and 27 fighters had met the first air attack group of the enemy in mid-air. Such a rare encounter was completely unforeseen by either side. Half of the Japanese fighters broke off to engage the enemy group. A furious free-for-all dogfight ensued high over the Pacific, midway between the opposing task forces. All eight American fighters were shot down, but not in vain. They enabled the American bombers to carry out the attack which put Shokaku out of action. The Japanese attack group, which went ahead with a reduced escort, also had a difficult job hitting Hornet. Seven Japanese bombers were lost. 
It appears that the group of 21 bombers and eight fighters from Hornet hit our vanguard unit, while the smaller group of Enterprise planes hit Shokaku. Why this bigger force of Hornet planes chose the vanguard group of cruisers instead of the two carriers at the core still remains a mystery to me. The cruisers were then 120 miles ahead of us, having stretched out the original distance of 60 miles as a result of Nagumo's turnarounds. The Hornet group must simply have failed to discover the core. Only cruiser Chikuma in the van was damaged. Several bomb hits caused it to lose speed, and it was sent back to Truk with two destroyers in escort. American failure to follow through on their initial attacks left the initiative completely in Japanese hands. While Hornet was being abandoned, Enterprise was ruthlessly bombed by fresh groups of Japanese bombers. Kincaid, seeing the operation fail, started to withdraw all his forces. It took us too long, however, to realise that the enemy was being routed. With nightmarish memories of the Midway debacle still fresh, we could not imagine that the American and Japanese positions were now the reverse of what they had been at Midway. After the brief but effective attack on Shokaku, live destroyers, including mine, surrounding Zuikaku had a field day rescuing ditched Japanese flyers. Amatsukaze rushed to pick up two bomber crewmen. The pilot was wounded in the left leg. He said, bullets hit my fuel tank. It was a miracle that the plane didn't explode. Next, a torpedo bomber touched on Zuikaku's deck but could not be stopped. The plane skidded wildly, turned over and crashed into the ocean. My ship raced toward the scene but plane and crew sank before we could reach them. A fighter ditched alongside my ship. I ordered full speed reverse and halted in time to pick up the badly wounded flyer before the plane sank. While my crewmen applied first aid, the young pilot breathed his last, murmuring, Mother! That day... Amatsukaze rescued 13 flyers from the sea. Three others died soon after being picked up. The two remaining carriers worked furiously. Junyo joined Zuikaku in early forenoon and hurled a second attack wave of 15 planes at 11.6. Five minutes later, Zuikaku flung 13 planes at the fleeing Americans. Kakuta's Junyo kept up its dogged advance and sent off a third group of attackers made up of planes which had returned and refuelled in the early afternoon. But not every Japanese admiral was as aggressive as Kakuta. Vice Admiral Nobutaka Kondo, deputy commander-in-chief of the combined fleet, led battleships Congo and Haruna, escorted by about a dozen cruisers and destroyers. This unit, with its powerful bombardment punch, made only a half-hearted advance. Also reluctant was Rear Admiral Koki Abe's vanguard unit of two battleships and five destroyers. His cruiser, Chikuma, with two destroyers, had already left the battle zone. Exposed for the first time to a furious American air attack, Abe apparently was too cautious. When orders came from Truk in the afternoon to chase and mop up the fleeing enemy, it was too late. Kondo's fast ships dashed at 30 knots, but could not shave the 300-mile distance to the fleeing enemy. Thus, Kondo's blunder enabled the enemy to get away without additional loss or damage. Destroyers Makigumo and Akigumo reached Hornet in the night. Two American ships near the helpless carrier turned and fled, and the Japanese destroyers finished off the burning hulk with four torpedoes. Nagumo had returned to the area in destroyer Arashi early in the morning of October 27. The fires in Shokaku were brought under control shortly after noon. Nagumo transferred his flag from Arashi to Zuikaku and resumed command in that carrier. Many planes were sent out by Zuikaku and Junyo, but they were unable to find the enemy fleet anywhere within their 300-mile scouting radius. At 6.30 on October 27, Nagumo called off the operation. All ships of his force gathered during the day and turned triumphantly toward Truk. The balance sheet of the Santa Cruz battle follows. Thus, numerically or tactically, it was a Japanese victory. The enemy had entered the fray with a tactical and psychological advantage, but complacence had cost them a high price. The enemy was able to strike at times and places of his own choosing. To his surprise, the head and tail of the Japanese opponent were versatile and flexible, contrary to Midway, and they struck back effectively with what force they had, in proper fashion as decreed by Sun Tzu. Despite Japan's numerical victory in this action, the strategic victory belonged to the enemy. 
As a result of this battle, the Americans won valuable time which permitted them to strengthen forces and prepare for the next action. This was achieved at nominal cost because our centre force under Admiral Kondo was lacking in spirit. If it had responded as it should have, and as did the head and tail, the destruction of the enemy forces could have been complete. Jubilance over the Santa Cruz victory did not last long. Orders awaited Admiral Nagumo at Truk. On November 2nd, he was relieved from command of the Third Fleet, the official title of his task force, and transferred to the homeland as commandant of the Sasebo Naval Station. On learning of this rotation, I went to see him, not knowing whether to offer congratulations or sympathy. Nagumo was a haggard old man. He seemed to have aged twenty years in the last six months. Glad to see you, Hara, he beamed. You have done a terrific job. I am proud of you. I blushed, and after a clumsy silence, ventured, You don't look good, Admiral Nagumo. Are you sick? Oh, just a touch of flu, he replied casually. Once back home I'll be in good shape, and return soon to join you in the fight. Yes, sir. Sasebo's climate will cure you, and you deserve a rest. You have been in combat continuously for a year. Compared with your duty, I've been on a pleasure cruise. Well, you'll have a tougher time from now on. All the carriers except Junio are going home for repairs, and we have lost some of our best flyers. It will be some time before new flyers can be properly trained. I beg your pardon, sir, but are Shokaku, Zuikaku, Zuiho and Hiyo all going to be 2,500 miles away in home waters? Must we fight with only Junyo's air support? Yes, Hara. Damage to our ships was minor at Santa Cruz, but we lost a number of our best pilots and flight leaders. Just between us, Hara, this battle was a tactical win, but a shattering strategic loss for Japan. As you know, I made a special study of America's war potential during my stay in the States. Considering the great superiority of our enemy's industrial capacity, we must win every battle overwhelmingly. This last one, unfortunately, was not an overwhelming victory. Nagumo was relieved by Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa, a noted destroyer expert, whose ability as a task force commander was unknown. The news was received with mixed feelings. We knew that Nagumo was completely exhausted and not fit for combat duty. Everyone hoped that our new commander would work a wonder and lead us to great victories. Next I visited Kakuta, who had been promoted, to congratulate him. The Vice Admiral was in high spirits as usual, but he grew serious when we discussed the fact that his task force would be operating with the only Japanese carrier in the southwest Pacific. The atmosphere in Admiral Yamamoto's combined fleet headquarters was grim and tense when I paid my courtesy call. Since the 2nd Division had taken such a beating, the Army had decided to commit the 38th Division to Guadalcanal. The Army asked Yamamoto for his full support in providing transportation. He had no choice but to comply. Yamamoto knew that all his units were particularly tired after the Santa Cruz battle, but he had to send them out again, and this time with insufficient air cover. Yamamoto rationalised that the enemy had suffered such losses at Santa Cruz that he must be equally exhausted. For a while in early November, this rationale appeared to have substance when 20 Japanese destroyers succeeded in landing the entire 38th Division in runs made on the 2nd, 7th, 8th and 10th without enemy obstruction. But the United States Navy, exactly as in the previous operation, was waiting only for correct timing. The Americans came back and clashed with the Japanese in a series of savage sea battles off Guadalcanal, November 1215. I took part in the first of this series and found that Nagumo's prediction was right. It was much tougher than any previous battle of my experience. I torpedoed and sank cruiser Juno and destroyer Barton and damaged Rear Admiral Daniel T. Callaghan's flagship San Francisco. Two shells from American cruiser Helena mowed down 43 of my men while I stood uninjured in their midst. I was fortunate to survive the battle. This was one of the most fantastic sea battles of modern history, in that it was fought at almost point-blank range between 14 Japanese and 13 American warships. Japan lost one battleship and two destroyers. Of the American fleet, only three destroyers and one badly battered cruiser survived. A number of the American commanding officers were killed. It was one of the worst United States defeats of the entire Pacific War. Yet Japan was not entirely happy with the results. 
In fact, the commanding Japanese officer was court-martialed and retired for his disgraceful leadership. The battle was extremely confused. True details, except for the final score, will probably never be known. I have sought to reconstruct the battle in as complete, objective and unbiased a manner as possible. Rear Admiral Koki Abe, a destroyer specialist and a combat veteran, commanded the Japanese ships. He was known for his extreme caution, which his critics claim often amounted to timidity. In the Santa Cruz battle he had commanded the vanguard unit which withstood United States air attacks, but failed to give effective chase to the fleeing enemy forces at the end. Admiral Abe was not enthusiastic when he received Yamamoto's orders to lead a 14-ship squadron in a shore bombardment with incendiary shells, as Kurita had done the previous month. Abe did not believe the Americans were so stupid that the very same formula of attack could succeed again against the jealously guarded island. Abe's mood was bad, particularly after learning of the October 11 battle off Savo Island, in which his lifelong friend, Rear Admiral Aritomo Goto, was killed. Survivors told Abe that they had been caught off guard by the enemy's radar-equipped ships led by Rear Admiral Norman Scott. Abe also knew that Goto had died, believing he was the victim of friendly gunfire. On the smashed bridge of cruiser Furutaka, he breathed his last murmuring Bakayaro, Bakayaro. The dying admiral uttered this profanity at what he believed to be the Japanese responsible for his death, also perhaps at himself. It was an ignoble death scene for a commanding admiral, and Abe, unhappy to hear of it, was determined not to follow Goto's example. Abe rightly interpreted the unopposed landing of the 38th Division as a deceptive lull, like the one which preceded the Santa Cruz battle. He was prepared for the worst. My Amatsukaze left Truk November 9th in a group of eight destroyers with light cruiser Nagara. These ships joined Abe's two battleships and three more destroyers near Shortland Island in the early morning of the 12th. At 8.30 that day, some 300 miles north of our destination, we were sighted by a B-17. Junio planes were sent up by Kakuta to repel it, and the enemy plane left without dropping any bombs. But there was no doubt that the American plane had learned all he needed to know about our movement. This early enemy contact increased Abe's natural cautiousness. Also, by this time he was reading reports about the enemy's successful reinforcement efforts of November 11 and 12. At 13.30, Abe called for a drastic change in formation. Our single column was ordered into a tight double-half ring formation. Five destroyers spread out in an arc, 8,000 metres ahead of cruiser Nagara. Six other destroyers drew a half ring fanning out from Nagara, with 2,000 metres between each ship. Flagship Hiei and sister Kirishima, 27,500 tonne battleships followed in column behind Nagara with 2,000 metres between each of them. This tight formation was completed by 14, when we were within 200 miles of Guadalcanal. I thought the aim of this formation was to prevent surprise attack by submarines or aircraft during our approach to the target area. I never dreamed that Abe was so concerned over a surprise attack that he would stick to this complex setup throughout the operation. While we proceeded south at 18 knots, Hie catapulted a scout plane. An hour passed with no message from the plane. No enemy planes came either. The weather suddenly turned bad. Thick clouds gathered rapidly, bringing a tropical rainstorm. It was a tremendous driving downpour which covered everything in darkness. It became difficult to see the nearest vessel. Nerves tightened in Amatsukaze as we waited expectantly for orders to slow down and change to a less complex formation. No such orders came. To Abe, the storm was a blessing. He knew that, cloaked in such a rain squall, his squadron was safe from air, surface and submarine attack. At his staff officer's advice to slow down, he snorted, We must maintain this speed to reach the target area in good time. A rain squall on tropical seas is normally limited to a small area, and seldom lasts more than a few minutes. To our growing amazement, this squall appeared to be endless, we continued to advance at 18 knots. Two hours passed without let-up of the cascading rain. Sweat streamed down our faces and bodies, despite the torrent of rain which drenched us like rats. In peacetime, a force commander would never take his ships through a blinding storm at such speed and in such a complex formation. Anything could happen. On that day, however, 
Not a single hitch developed in the long, almost blind dash. This performance, which lasted more than seven hours, attests to the seamanship of Japanese destroyer crews. The same high proficiency kept us from shooting each other in the confused battle which ensued. American reports claimed that some of our ships fired on each other, but this is not true. On Hiei's bridge, Abe was in a buoyant mood. To his drenched officers, he said, This blessed squall is moving at the same speed and on the same course as we are. The first message came in from the scout plane. More than a dozen enemy warships seen off Lunga, and Abe chortled. If heaven continues to side with us like this, we may not even have to do business with them. The squadron pressed on. Hours passed, but the rain squall did not abate. If anything, it got stronger. In all the years of my career, I never experienced such a rain. It was completely enervating. My officers were bored and expressed their boredom. Ensign Shoji said, Phew, this rain is killing me. I am fed up. Let us fight the Americans, not this rain. We were nearing our goal at 22, if all 14 of our ships had navigated accurately. On board Hie, Abe pored over the charts. Being a destroyer expert, he knew the skill of each of his skippers, and he knew that Rear Admiral Susumu Kimura in Nagara was one of Japan's top navigators. Abe had just received a message from the Army Observation Post on Guadalcanal saying, Weather now very bad here. The Hie scout plane, unheard of since its Lunga report, had gone onto the airstrip on Bougainville, rather than attempt locating Hie in the storm. Admiral Abe realised that an accurate bombardment was impossible in the storm, so he made his decision to get out of the southbound squall. Accordingly, Hie radioed by ultra-short wave. All ships stand by for a simultaneous 180-degree turn. I responded immediately. From Amatsukaze to Hie, standing by for a simultaneous 180-degree turn. The execute signal usually follows such a message within 30 seconds. I peered anxiously at my watch. Timing is essential in such a manoeuvre if collisions are to be avoided. One minute passed, no orders. One minute and thirty seconds, still silent. For God's sake, I thought, this can't be true. I hollered into the radio room tube. No execute order yet? A nervous voice replied, No, sir. Van destroyers Udachi and Harusami have not yet acknowledged the standby orders. Three minutes passed. The tube boomed again. Commander, Hiei is talking to Yudachi and Harusami on medium wave frequency. Oh no, I cried. Has Hiei lost its mind? Medium wave radio can easily be picked up by the enemy. Thus, our advantage of the rain squall would be squandered by Hiei. At 22, the radio man shouted, Hiei orders 180 degree turn for all ships. Righto, I yelled at the top of my voice. Turn 180 degrees. My destroyer turned cleanly. I looked around desperately, fearful that another ship would suddenly appear on a collision course. Nothing happened. The drastic course change in a complex formation had miraculously succeeded. Hiei's next order was, all ships slow to 12 knots. Abe would not take unnecessary chances. From his many years of experience, he knew the original formation must be considerably askew after seven hours of blind marching and the drastic 180-degree turn. He was right. The formation was certainly scattered. I found out later that even before the Hiei order, the five destroyers arcing 8,000 metres ahead of Nagara had to turn around to keep from running aground on Guadalcanal. The van arc was thus broken into two and three destroyers, and thus divided, the two groups drew increasingly apart. This factor had an important bearing on the battle as it developed. The rain squall finally ended at 2240, more than 30 minutes after we began the backward run. Abe ordered another 180 degree turn to take us back to the dangerous island. I was sure he would now form the force into a single column. Our complex formation was good for opposing attacks by small torpedo boats, but we would be stymied if an enemy stormed us in strength. Abe, maintaining his cautious stand, steadfastly held to the formation. For the first time I began to doubt his wisdom. In battle it is bad to doubt one's leader, but I thought it was meaningless to keep such a formation after exposing ourselves to the enemy by our use of medium-wave radio. The enemy was sure to locate us and to strike. Small island, 60 degrees to port, a lookout's shout ended my musing. Almost simultaneously another hollered, high mountains dead ahead. 
I turned to the left and saw the black, chunky form of Savo Island looming out of the darkness. Forward, I saw the mountains of Guadalcanal barely visible against a dark background of clouds. Feeling that battle was imminent, I trembled in excitement and breathed deeply of the balmy night breeze. I shouted, Prepare for gun and torpedo attack to starboard. Gun range, 3,000 meters. Torpedo firing angle, 15 degrees. Silence prevailed in our ship as every man went to his battle station. In Hie, Abe was studying various reports. Guadalcanal observers radioed that the rain had just cleared and that they could see no enemy ships off Lunga. Bougainville reported sending out float planes. Fifty minutes after the second turnaround, the squadron was about twelve miles offshore. Abe was still undecided and sighed wearily. Tell Hie and Kirishima to ready main batteries for Type 3 shelling. In the two ships, the huge one-ton shells, each loaded with hundreds of incendiary bombs, were stacked up and ready around the turrets. The gunners were itching for fire orders. At 23.42, a message came in from Yudachi. Enemy sighted. What is the range and bearing? Abe roared. And where is Yudachi? Abe had hardly finished his outburst when Hie's masthead lookout frantically shouted, Four black objects ahead look like warships. Five degrees to starboard. Eight thousand meters. Unsure yet. Visibility bad. Abe covered his face. Udachi was ten thousand meters ahead on our starboard bow. Ask him distance. Commander Masakone Suzuki, Abe's chief of staff, shouted at the lookout. Is eight thousand correct? Confirm. It may be nine thousand, sir. Abe, visibly shaken, said in a faltering voice, Tell he and Kirishima gunners to replace all those incendiaries with armor-piercing, and set turrets for firing forward. Abe staggered to his chair. He was in agony. Should he order the two battleships to turn around while they changed shells? He deliberated and finally decided not to, figuring that at such short range his battleships would be sitting ducks for the oncoming enemy. This indecision, it was later ruled, cost him his ship. On the decks of the two battleships there was pandemonium. Almost every hand had left his battle station to help cart away the Type Three shells. There was a stampede in the magazines, men pushing and kicking to reach the armor-piercing shells stored deep inside. At a range of 9,000 meter scapital ships can fire with deadly accuracy. Just one shell landing on the deck of either of these battleships, stacked high with mountains of incendiary shells, could ignite it like a mammoth matchbox. Hie's signal officers screamed hysterically over the radio. Ultra shortwave, ordinary shortwave and medium wave. All available frequencies were used to announce the presence of the enemy. Security precautions were thrown to the winds. On Amatsukaze's bridge the notice came as no surprise. I watched uneasily, however, as Hie's crewmen scurried like scared rats. My lookouts still could not see any enemy ships, and they squirmed. No sweat, boys, I shouted. We are well prepared to engage when the distance is down to 3,000 metres. Mysteriously, for eight long minutes, no shells came from the enemy. Their combined speed of 40 knots meant that the two forces were closing at a rate of 1,200 metres per minute, and still no gunfire. What a contrast to the Java Sea battle, when both sides started firing at a range of more than 25,000 metres. The pandemonium in Hie and Kirishima was over. All incendiaries had been removed and the guns were ready to fire regular armour-piecing shells. Why had the enemy allowed us to gain the precious eight minutes which saved us from catastrophe? Seeking an explanation, I have read American post-war accounts of the battle. The answer was complex and difficult to come by because most of the high-ranking officers in the American task force died in this action. All versions I read were based on fragmentary and often conflicting accounts by survivors. I learned, however, that the enemy's inability to open fire during the critical eight minutes was the result of an impossible deployment and confused command. At 23.41, when Udachi reported her sighting, the enemy force was advancing in a single column headed directly against the core of the Japanese unit. From such a formation only the leading ship could fire. That accounts for the enemy gun inactivity at the outset, but it does not explain subsequent events. Why did they not swing sharply to the right to bring their turrets into firing position? Why did they not choose the other alternative of going close in shore to flank our ships to starboard? These questions still puzzle me. There were other unusual things about this battle. 
One of these was the movement of our destroyer Yudachi. Her skipper, Commander Kiyoshi Kikawa, was a close friend, and after the battle he explained this to me. My blunder was in being overcautious. I had been in the Bali Sea Battle the previous February. In that action my destroyer Mitsushio was flanked and badly damaged while I was directing our fire on a target in another direction. I never forgot that bitter lesson. On November 12, my Yudachi with Harusami was searching for the three other ships with which we had originally formed the Vanguard Arc. In our hunting, we never guessed that the earlier mix-up in the two 180-degree turns had brought the other three to the rear instead of the van. I was flabbergasted to see an enemy destroyer suddenly emerging from the darkness and bearing down to strike us amidship. The nightmare of Bali flashed to my mind. Anyway, I was not ready to fire. We frantically turned away, radioing the discovery to Hiei, but we could not give positions because we did not know where we were relative to our own forces. We ran for a few minutes and I saw gunfire. I was covered with confusion and shame. I ordered Yudachi about to head back toward the American column. By that time every man in my ship was boiling mad at our failure to hit the enemy. From then on, Yudachi fought valiantly until she sank. Harusame, however, went on to join Nagara. Apparently it lost track of us in the darkness. Yudachi was running on over boost at 35 knots. Not only was the vanguard arc broken, but also the inner ring. The seven hours of blind march and the two rapid 180-degree turns were too severe a test for any formation. Ye shone its searchlight at 2350 to find that Nagara was no longer 2,000 metres ahead as it had been. The 36-knot cruiser had advanced some 5,000 metres ahead of its position and veered to port in front of destroyer Yukikaze, which was preceding my ship by 2,000 metres. When Hiei's light spotted cruiser Atlanta, an estimated 5,000 metres away, the latter responded instantly with a full salvo of 5-inch guns. Hastily aimed, all 12 shells fell some 2,000 metres short of Hiei. 30 seconds later, Hiei, swinging to port, opened with its eight 14-inch guns. A range of 5,000 metres is almost point-blank for guns of this size. Almost all the one-ton shells hit Atlanta. Rear Admiral Norman Scott and practically all other officers on the bridge were killed in an instant. Thus, Abe's opening salvo avenged his friend Goto. It was one of the most accurate ship-to-ship -ship bombardments of the entire Pacific War. Hie paid a high price for her use of the searchlight, Four American destroyers in front of Atlanta concentrated their fire on Hie at distances ranging from a few hundred to two thousand yards. Lead ship Cushing poured several main battery salvos and torrents of machine gun fire onto Hie's bridge. Badly aimed, however, these shells and tracers cascaded down around my Amatsukaze. The spectacle was so dazzling that for many moments I stood blinded on the bridge. Fortunately, no hits were scored on my ship. Cushing is reported to have released six torpedoes at Hie. None hit. If they overran, none of my crewmen saw them. I am thus inclined to doubt the claim. Cushing's shells and tracers, however, kept crossing over Hie and showering down around Amatsukaze, seeming to pin us down. Ahead to port was the black coastline of Florida Island, with its many reefs. I shouted, Gain speed! Let's get the hell out of here to starboard! The ship responded quickly. It broke away from Hie, and, followed by destroyer Yukikaze, raced past to starboard of Nagara. I saw numerous American ships moving like wraiths in the darkness along the coast of Guadalcanal to the right. Turn full right, flank speed! I decided to tackle the enemy ships and deal them a blow before they got in position to hit our confined formation. The next moment, the wraith-like images disappeared into the black coastline. Momentarily blinded by the shells and tracers, I blinked and stared frantically until tears came to my eyes. I gazed intently ahead. Three Japanese destroyers suddenly appeared from Hiei's right flank, preventing me from shooting at the enemy. Despairing of offensive action at the moment, I looked at Hiei. Her rugged mast was in flames. American destroyer Laffey must have scored some hits. I cursed that misfortune and then noticed that the three friendly destroyers had started a swerve to port, obviously trying to cover Hiei from the rear. The three ships, Akatsuki, Inazuma and Ikazuchi, were newer ships and faster than mine. I planned to follow behind their column. All of a sudden a couple of flares lit up ahead. 
Later, I learned from Admiral Kimura that Nagara had fired them. Five or six enemy ships in a column emerged clearly. The nearest was 5,000 metres, 30 degrees on my starboard bow, approaching on a roughly parallel course. I gulped. My heart bubbled with excitement. This was the chance to prove my torpedo theory. Though adopted as doctrine by the Imperial Navy, it had remained unproved. This was my chance. Lieutenant Masatoshi Miyoshi, my torpedo officer, yelled impatiently, Commander, let's fire the fish. I answered, Get ready, fisherman, and barked instructions. The target, 30 degrees to starboard, is approaching. Adjusted firing angle, 15 degrees. Navigators, turn right, close in and follow a hyperbola. The crew responded instantly. The distance closed steadily as the adversaries approached at a combined speed of 60 knots. Miyoshi glared at me eagerly, impatiently, but I ignored him. The enemy strangely failed to open fire. Even if they did, they could not catch me in the hyperbola run, though we were separated by only 3,000 metres. Ready torpedoes fire, I yelled. Eight big fish jumped in rapid succession and sped on their way. I watched prayerfully. It was 2354. Gusts of wind buffeted us on the bridge and we were showered by spray kicked up by the dashing ship. As we turned left again, slackening speed, another couple of flares filled the sky, limbing a column of four enemy destroyers, a distance of only a few hundred yards between each. Yudachi, guns blazing, had cut in front of the American column, almost grazing the bows of Aaron Ward, which made a violent turn to avoid it. The second ship, Barton, stopped short to avoid collision with Aaron Ward. At that moment, two minutes after the launching of my torpedoes, Two pillars of fire shot high in the air from Barton. These fireworks subsided so quickly that I rubbed my eyes in disbelief. The ship, broken in two, sank instantly. I heaved a deep sigh. It was a spectacular kill, and there was a roaring ovation from my crew, but I didn't hear it. It was all too easy. My own feeling was one of satisfaction rather than exultation. It was the first real war test of my theory, which was now a proved formula. The flares burned down and out. In the renewed darkness, Amatsukaze looped out of her firing hyperbola and headed back to the west, while I determined what to do. In the distance I could see Hie, barely silhouetted by its own fires. We headed in her direction. A few minutes later we saw dim, intermittent flashes to port. The flashes outlined a sleek ship, with four masts, definitely enemy, possibly a cruiser. Torpedoes ready, I ordered. Target 70 degrees to port. Torpedoes ready, sir, Lieutenant Miyoshi called back like a student answering his professor, with no trace of his earlier impatience. All right, hold it, hold it, hold it. The target is moving ahead. Easy, easy, easier target than the last. Miyoshi, use only four torpedoes this time, not eight steady, steady fire. In hushed silence, the four deadly fish left at 23.59. Three minutes and forty seconds later, a large reddish flame rose from our target. It was American cruiser Juno that had been exchanging gunfire with Yudachi. My crewmen roared with joy. Lieutenant Shimizu, the gunnery officer, wanted to bombard the target and finish it off. I said, no, Shimizu, let's leave the spoil for our friend Yudachi. Don't be impatient, we'll have plenty of targets. Shelling at this stage would only expose our position to the enemy. Amatsukaze went straight ahead. Meanwhile, savage fights were going on in other places. Commander Hideo Sakino of Hie later recounted to me how the flagship fought. Destroyer Cushing, after its attack on Hie, was caught by fire from destroyer Terutsuki. The Japanese ship had advanced from its position on Hie's port quarter, and once Cushing fell under the scrutiny of Japanese searchlights, it was finished off by a point-blank salvo from Terutsuki. The second American destroyer Laffey almost collided with Hie. While skidding away from a close shave, Laffey let loose a torrent of machine gun fire at Hie's mast, riddling the bridge. Captain Suzuki was killed instantly. Others, including Admiral Abe, were wounded. Hie's big guns and Terutsuki's torpedoes caught Laffey going away. The destroyer was hit mercilessly and sunk within a few minutes. Destroyer Sterrett, next in line, fired torpedoes at Hie. All missed. O'Bannon, following, shelled the battleship and scored many hits. Hie's internal communications went dead at this time, and the Japanese flagship started to withdraw from action. This was just about midnight, 
and the fighting became terribly confused. A free-for-all followed. Destroyer Akatsuki, from her original position 2,000 metres to starboard of Hie, had dashed forward and fired torpedoes which hit cruiser Atlanta. Akatsuki thus became caught in fatal crossfire between San Francisco and an American destroyer and was sunk with almost her entire crew. San Francisco was still battering Akatsuki when battleship Kirishima approached and finished off flagship San Francisco with deadly blows from its powerful 14-inch guns. Kirishima then left the area quickly in compliance with Abe's orders. Commander Kikawa, skipper of Yudachi, narrated the night's activities of his destroyer. When we returned and crossed the American column, I saw an enemy destroyer on the port beam coming directly at me. There was no time to aim torpedoes. While exchanging gunfire, I swung hard right to rattle the enemy's aim and timing. After running for a few minutes, I saw cruiser Juno to starboard on a parallel course. Yudachi fired eight torpedoes at her, but all missed. The cruiser answered with a powerful salvo, to which I could respond only with guns. That was bad. I felt I was pinned at last. A destroyer cannot outgun a cruiser. Then all of a sudden a burst of flames rose from the cruiser. It stopped firing, spread smoke screens and quit the fight. It was Yorama Tsukazi that saved me. When Akatsuki was sunk, the two Japanese destroyers next behind her vengefully attacked San Francisco and Portland. The latter responded with gunfire on Inazuma and Ikazuchi. At the same time, unpredictable Yudachi was closing Portland on the port quarter. Kikawa said, I just repeated your tactics, Hara, and released eight torpedoes at the cruiser which was occupied with fighting in the other direction. The ship burst into flames when our torpedoes hit. Our jubilation was cut short when shells showered down on us. I was a victim of the same tactics we had just used, and now we were being bashed by someone off our stern. This must have been American destroyer Aaron Ward, which had been putting up a determined battle since Yudachi had crossed its path some ten minutes earlier. About that same time, my Amatsukaze was moving northwest toward the crippled flagship. The scene was strangely quiet. Dim, distant gunfire appeared like fireworks. It was impossible to tell who was fighting. I had decided to join Hie, which, with its deck fires, was the only ship that could be recognized. I asked if there were any important messages. A radio man replied, No, sir, but we are not reading Hie. Her communications must be out. Glumly, I looked at my watch. It was thirteen minutes past midnight. A red flash far to the west proved to be another ship set afire. That was Yudachi. I screamed as a big ship suddenly appeared out of the darkness just in front of us. Lieutenant Kinjuro Matsumoto spun the helm frantically to the right. There was nothing that the rest of us on the bridge could do but watch helplessly as the ships drew swiftly closer. Just as a collision seemed inevitable, Amatsukaze responded to her rudder, and we avoided a collision. I wondered what ship it could be. We passed so close I could not see its whole shape. There was no apparent activity on board. It had no turrets, but it was not a merchant ship. It was familiar, and yet I couldn't place it. This disturbed me as I knew every kind of ship, and decided that this must be Jingay. She was a submarine tender and had no turrets. But what was she doing here? The next moment I realised it could not be Jingay, and knew this must be an enemy ship. I jumped up and yelled, Gunners! Torpedo men! Stand ready to port! Lieutenants Miyoshi and Shimizu shouted their readiness, but at the crucial moment I wavered again. We must identify the ship for sure, and not fire at a friend under any circumstances. In desperation I ordered searchlights. Our target appeared unmistakably to be an enemy cruiser. I ordered open fire with everything we had. Four torpedoes leaped out. They were the last of our full load of sixteen. All six of our four-inch guns roared for the first time in this battle. Enthusiastic gun crews fired rapid salvos. Almost every shell hit the target in this point-blank bombardment. Explosions were so near that the blasts were shaking me. Fires shot up at scores of places. Yet the enemy seemed so taken by surprise that there was no counter-attack. Some twenty seconds after we opened the attack, four solid underwater sounds were detected. I held my breath anticipating mighty explosions. Ten seconds passed, but there was no detonation. As the ship wobbled on, I realised my stupid mistake. Every Japanese torpedo had a safety device which prevented detonation under any circumstance within 500 metres of its launching, and our target was no more than 500 metres away. 
I cursed my stupidity. Through haste I had lost the chance to make a certain sinking. One blunder usually follows another, and it did here. Wild with anger at myself, I forgot to order the searchlight to be turned off. Kikawa had reminded me that a searchlight always attracts enemy eyes, and I had forgotten the lesson. The enemy ship swerved to the left, perhaps to avoid collision, but its movements were erratic. Meanwhile, my gun crews continued firing as though shell-drunk. Every shot was hitting home. The phantom ship wobbled on, spewing fire and smoke throughout its length. This was San Francisco, and our near collision must have occurred just after Admiral Callaghan and his staff, as well as the cruiser's own staff, had been wiped out by other Japanese ships. The turrets, whose absence puzzled me, had been blown to bits by direct hits from Kirishima's 14-inch guns. All of a sudden, shells were failing around my ship. I thought that the phantom ship had revived and was offering a last-ditch fight. Some shell shit a Matsukaze. Gunners, don't budge an inch, I roared. Finish it off. Evidently, I was shell-drunk too. Our guns continued to pump shells into the enemy ship, my third blunder. Actually, there were no shells coming from the dying San Francisco. A shrieking voice came through the deafening roar of guns. Warrant Officer Shigeru Iwata was shouting at me from his observation post just above the bridge. Commander, another cruiser is sniping at us from 70 degrees to port. My head snapped to that direction, and there was another enemy cruiser. I stood frozen from head to toe, but finally yelled, Douse searchlight, stop shelling, spread smoke screen. I had not finished the order when the third salvo from the new enemy, later identified as Helena, reached Amatsukaze. Two shells landed very near. I hunched my back and clung to the railing. The blast was so strong, it almost threw me off the bridge. The detonations were deafening. I got sluggishly to my feet, but my mind was a complete blank for several seconds. Next, I felt over my body, but found no wounds. Looking around, I saw with relief that all my nearby fellow officers were alive. What about others? I saw Iwata prostrate, hanging over the range-finding gear. Iwata! Iwata! I cried. What's the matter with you? He did not move. Blood covered his head. A piece of shrapnel had pierced his skull, killing him instantly. A shell had exploded at the fire director station immediately above Iwata's observation post. Shimizu! Shimizu! I called at his voice tube. How are you? No reply came through. Radio men, report! I shouted into another tube. This tube was also dead silent. A second shell had pierced the deck slightly below the bridge and exploded in the radio room, killing everyone in it. The ship was still turning sharply to the right and was now starting into a loop. Matsumoto, turn the helm! I shouted. I did turn, sir, but there is no response. Flames rose from under the bridge, apparently from the radio room. More fires flared. Helena had really done a job on us. Damn it, let's return fire. A gunner struggled to the bridge, blood dripping from a shoulder wound. Sir, the turrets won't move. The hydraulic system has failed. An orderly came from the engine room, shouting, The rudder mechanism no longer works, sir. The hydraulics have failed. I talked to both men at once. What happened to Shimizu? How's the engine? Any fuel fires? Lieutenant Shimizu was blasted from the ship, sir, leaving behind only one of his legs. The engine works unimpaired, sir. The fuel has not caught fire. All right, you gunner. Go get first aid. Matsumoto, go to the engine room and check. Send reports to me every three minutes. The ship had come full circle on the ocean and was about to begin a second loop. Helena's shells were still raining around, but very few were now hitting. Near misses shook the ship violently. More fires were starting, but crewmen were active with water hoses. Our guns were still silent, and we had no torpedoes. If the enemy closed, we would be as defenseless as a bull in a slaughterhouse. Amatsukaze's movements were getting more erratic, and she started her second circle in dense smoke. The rain of shells diminished as the enemy ship at last began to move away. Good, he was not going to finish the job. An orderly came with Matsumoto's message. The hydraulic system is definitely out. We'll have to operate the rudder with manpower. Please confirm. All right, tell him to halt the ship for the shift to manpower operation right away. Miyoshi winced and said, Are we going to stop right here, sir? So near the enemy? Certainly, before we encounter more enemy ships. One of the voice pipes squawked. It was Matsumoto reporting. Commander, 
We have patched some of the damage. Good, Matsumoto. Stop the ship and shift the rudder for manpower operation. As the ship slowly shuddered to a halt, the enemy shelling stopped completely. Apparently, the enemy ship had turned around thinking that Amatsukaze was done for. Through the dense smoke, I could no longer see the enemy ship. Actually, Helena was having its own troubles, more serious than mine. As it had caught me unaware, so it was caught unaware by three freshly arrived Japanese destroyers. The trio, Asagumo, Murasame and Samidare, originally had been in the vanguard arc formation with Yudachi and Harusame. Because of the drastic pre-battle manoeuvres, they had fallen to the rear just before the battle started. They finally came on the scene barely in time to catch Helena. The enemy cruiser was battered helpless by three ships emerging from nowhere. Before it could determine who and where the new opponents were, Helena was defeated. Murasame's torpedoes delivered fatal blows, but the cruiser miraculously drifted a few more hours before sinking. Asagumo, Murasame's teammate, turned its guns toward another enemy ship approaching from the east. Destroyer Monson, her identification lamps lit, approached naively in the belief that the three prowling ships were friendly. Her lamps were suicidal, just as my searchlight had been when it attracted Helena. Several rapid salvos disabled Monson, and Asagumo finished her with torpedoes. Monson had been followed closely by Fletcher, who, in no mood to challenge the Japanese trio, turned tail and cleared out. Sterrett, one of the surviving enemy destroyers, claimed the sinking of a Japanese destroyer at this time and location with two torpedo hits, but there was no such Japanese destroyer. Akatsuki had sunk some time earlier, and Yudachi was still burning several miles to the west. It appears evident that Sterrett must have mistakenly sunk an American vessel. Her victim must have been one that was still barely adrift after absorbing a surfeit of Japanese torpedoes and shells.